Okay, here we go. It's 3.30, let's proceed with lecture. We have a lot to talk about. Um, there's good old Will Rogers. Uh, this is the last uh, day for formal instruction. On Monday we will have class and I will give a wrap up uh, lecture uh, to summarize the semester and then we'll have a, a bonus point activity uh, using iClickers a little in-class review. So make sure to bring your iClicker next Monday as well. All right. Now, the week ahead. First of all, bam. Um, next Friday, a week from... You know what? We'll be finishing up a week from today. Because we're going to go 1 to 3.50. So do not come at 3.30. If you come at 3.30, you're toast. And here's why. This, the minute one of the students that's here on time at 1 o'clock finishes and turns in their paper, that's the last time that anybody can come late and start the test. So if, if somebody t turns in their exam and you aren't here yet, you are T-O-A-S-T. You are S-O-L. And I'm an I'm a S-O-B about that. Son of a Brickner. Uh, and you know you won't, be, but but actually I am serious. You won't be able to take the test, and I, it, it usually doesn't happen. But when it has happened, you know they're out. They, you know then they gotta, you know, take a bad grade. All right. So just make sure you're here. So engraved in your so-called mind, and everything will be good. Be on time, and just get in. You know, like in you know regular exams, just cram yourselves in and and uh, just get ready to roll. Okay, so. Uh, today's lecture 41, uh, which is right over here. Uh, and then next week we have lecture 42 on Monday. That'll be my wrap-up lecture. Uh, 10, 15 minutes, maybe a clicker question. And then we'll have a big clicker session in self-paced mode for bonus points. And it'll be a little one-page handout of, exam, of, not exam questions, but it'll look like an exam. And you'll click on it at, in self-paced mode. Uh, and I'll convert that score, you know, so you might get 15 out of 18. Right? So then I'll convert that to some fraction of four bonus points. You know, one, two, three, or four bonus points. Okay? There's also going to be a mega review. Um, uh, homework uh, starting in, for, for finals week. And I'll probably activate that this weekend. Tuesday office hours, um, if you want to come and study and, you know, get in a little bit of last minute. What is SI review? Where's Santi, anyways? Does, does anybody know where the SI review is? It's Monday? Sunday. Sunday? Oh, Sunday, okay. Uh, sorry, I don't have that on here, but hopefully you guys have got the scoop on that. Uh, Tuesday, I'll try to have an extra, at least one extra office hour. You know, so normally we have one to two. Hopefully, I can go two to th two to three as well. Make sure we we got a lot of stuff to cover here today. So don't don't try to talk over me. And of course, uh, next Friday is the final exam. Uh, now, uh, you might want to make a note of this. The and uh, you know, I've been talking to students. You know, and, you know, students have been asking me, well, Dr. B, you know, what's, what's going to be on the final? Everything's going to be on the final. And here's a, one way to think about it. It's going to be roughly divided into four parts. Um, the material for exam one will be in one of the four parts. Material from exam two will be in one of the four parts. Material from exam three will be in one of the four parts. And then the last four weeks which have not had their own midterm, but we actually have had enough lecture to do a midterm. Uh, that'll be the fourth part. Okay, so um, everything since exam three will be one-fourth of the test. It's a 72-point test. Uh, a student was, you know, not only one, but several students have been asking me, Dr. B, are we going to have written problems on the test? And, you know, I was shaving this morning, and, and the shaving is a good time to think about stuff, if you shave. And... Uh, 
I was thinking, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to um give one written problem. And I'm going to grade it. And I'll tell you one more thing. I'll even tell you what it's going to be about. Don't don't have a, a heart attack up there. I saw somebody go um, it's going to be an oscillator problem, and but it's going to but it's going to be more than an oscillator problem because it's a final exam. But it's probably not going to involve bumblebee or you know the skiers on the ramp. Although you will see skiers on the ramp, skiers on the ski hill uh, in the multiple choice part. I guarantee you that. Okay, but I think the written exam, the written problem is going to involve oscillators plus plus more stuff. So think of all the stuff that we started with back in January, and think now how can Dr. Brickner uh, attach this uh, to an oscillator problem, and just use that. Even today's lecture I might put in the oscillator problem. All right? So, uh, be that as it may, uh, there's going to be one written problem. So, now, the, the other thing I want to mention to you about the uh, uh, final exam is it's twice the size of a midterm. Now, we get 50 minutes roughly for a midterm, and you guys seem to do okay. The final is double the size, but you get 170 minutes, two hours and 50 minutes. So you have over three times as much time for double the size. So you should have plenty of time to complete the written problem and do a nice job with it. Okay. And, you know, I might even hand it out on a separate piece of paper um, and you'll put your name on it, the exam, and also your Scantron. So, so look for some, so look for like maybe seven, uh, 60 Scantron items, or 60 Scantron dots anyways, and then a 12-point written problem to be graded by me. All right, so you're going to want to study your problems, study my solutions, and make sure you write a good, good written problem solution, not just numbers everywhere. Um, and if you're, if you're a newbie here at UCF, as I know a few of you are, the, to figure out your exam schedule, if you haven't done this already, um, you go to the Registrar's website and you type in, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then the class meeting times, and it will tell you the, you know, the time for your exam. So this is what it looks like for us guys. All right, so remember, the ex final exam starts at 1, not 3.30. And do not, well, it's too late to, to warn you about plane tickets and stuff, I guess. Uh, but you're, you're going to need all the time. You're going to be busy here until almost 4 o'clock, most of you. There'll be a few people that will finish, you know, before 2. Uh, and they may not get a very good grade, but there's always a few that just blaze through stuff and they don't really care too much about their grade. But most of you will want to use all your time. All right. And we won't use the clickers on the final. So you can retire. You can, after Monday, you can sell your eye clicker if you want or return it for the rental. Uh, questions about any of that stuff? Where? Question. Okay, and one more reminder, uh, you may not use cell phones on the final, so uh, make sure you bring your regular calculator. You know, like this, uh, this baby, somebody just randomly left it up here on the front. And uh, anything like that will be fine. All right, let's talk about turbulence, chapter 12.5. And actually, we're going to dip uh, back into chapter 12.4 just a little bit. Uh, there's two different kinds of flow uh, that the authors uh, make, um, uh, make plain, and that's turbulent and laminar flow. Now, laminar flow, here's a quote from chapter 12.4. Laminar flow is characterized by the smooth flow uh, of the uh, fluid in the layers that do not, in layers that do not mix. So laminar, that means layers, lamination, layers. 
Um, turbulent flow or turbulence is characterized by eddies and swirls that mix layers of fluid together. Now, here's a picture uh, of some smoke rising from, you know, I don't know, a candle or something. And down the laminar flow part of this picture, it starts down here towards the bottom. All right, now you can see the flow of the smoke uh, upward uh, to about there. Now above that, you start seeing those wrinkles and bloops. All right, and that's going to be the turbulent up there. But, term, but laminar flow, the streamline for each pixel of the fluid uh, is smooth. So you don't have a wrinkly streamline. It's fairly smooth, not too much curvaceousness. Uh, nearby streamlines, they stay roughly parallel. So they don't curl back in on each other. Uh, and all streamlines approximate the bulk uh, velocity of the fluid. So a streamline, a parcel of fluid or a pixel of fluid on a streamline has its own velocity. And that's, in, in, in laminar flow, that's close to the bulk. You know, if you assign an average velocity to the bulk motion of the fluid at a given point, uh, the uh, streamlines are going to be pretty much a uh, parallel to that. All right. Now, turbulent flow is a little bit different. Here's a diagram uh, from the textbook, Chapter 12, Section 4, Figure 2. Uh, and this shows laminar and turbulent flows. On the left, you can see the friction. You can see the, the layers in different colors here. Uh, higher speed up here, more friction down here with the surface of the stream. So this is like a stream, a creek. And the bottom layer is not going very fast. The stuff on top is going fairly fast. You know, consider, you know if you consider this to be like um, water in a stream. Uh, and, uh, you know, the velocity vector gets smaller as it goes down. And that's because of increasing friction. So between each layer of water, there's a little bit of friction. Uh, or viscosity, and uh, and that tends to slow it down until down here you get uh, friction from above and then friction from this rough surface down here. Question? Yeah. So, so yeah. Since there's more weight above it. There's more weight above it, so the friction, you know, the friction force is going to be a little bit bigger down here, uh, and so friction force is going to be a little bit lower down here, gram for gram. Okay, and just because of the the pile of water above it. All right, and so uh, so that's laminar flow, and it's it's actually kind of interesting. It's the viscosity that keeps or that tends to keep uh, flow smooth. And you've you've heard that phrase, uh, throwing oil on troubled waters. You ever hear that? No. You've never heard that? Oh, kids these days. I don't know. Anyways. There's this phrase from back in the 1890s, I guess. Uh, throwing oil in troubled waters is a way of, you know, smoothing the sea, or at least that's what they thought. But, I mean, it, you know, oil has high viscosity, so it would tend to smooth out the surface of, of a fluid. Question? Um, it's not really about this, but do you think there's any benefits about replacement from like back before the time so we can, like, uh, The answer to that is yes, and I, sorry, I forgot to, I was planning to mention that. The answer is yes. I will be getting those back to you guys on Monday. Hopefully. All right. Now, over here on the right, here's the turbulent flow. And, it, and you know, the, the, the circle that I had up on the previous slide, it said, you know, that it's, it, the flow lines or the stream lines kind of curl in on themselves and stuff. And you can kind of see that. Now, a lot of times that's due to some kind of a, a bump in the surface below. Or, you know, you throw something in there, and you drop a rock, and that's going to cause a little bit of turbulence. You know, one of the, one of the most uh, amazing turbulence fields that I've ever seen is in New York City, uh, down um, at the back, where, where the, uh, the Staten Island Ferry comes in. The Staten Island Ferry goes from lower Manhattan out to Staten Island. And... When you look at your, if you're at the back end of the ferry as it leaves the dock, the, the, the port there, you know, you've got this enclosed area where there's some, you know, it moves out, you know, 15 feet, and there's 15 feet of water times the area of the 
or times the width uh, of the of the berth for the for the for the ferry, and those engines are just pumping water through there. It's just roiling and boiling. But you know what? Now that I think about it, has anybody ever been uh, on a cruise and looked out the back of the cruise as it moves away? Because I bet there's a lot of turbulence at the, you know, that's an even bigger vessel, you know, a cruise ship. Those things are gigantic, some of them. And, uh, and actually, here's, uh, you know, raise your, your hand if you're here in Florida, so nobody skis on mountains uh, because we don't have any, but raise your hand if you've been water skiing. Okay, a bunch of you. And you know that when you're water skiing, you gotta wait, you got to be careful of the wake of the boat that's towing you. And it, but, you know, if you're a good water skiing, you can make the wake, you know, work for you and stuff. But that's turbulence. And it's, and it's turbulence that starts at the surface of the boat, and then it propagates outward and, and backwards. So it kind of forms a V-shape. It's kind of cool. Uh, so that's, that's uh, so this picture here is kind of a, you know, uh, an idealized view of turbulence. Now, uh, let's take some specs on turbulence here. Um, the turbulent area in this photograph, getting back to figure one, uh, is from here up, roughly, okay, right up to the top of this photograph. Right, you can see it gets more and more uh, tangled, and the flow lines are all discombobulated and stuff. Uh, so let's take, take a look at that. So basically what happens... Uh, the, the streamlines break, perp, you know, roughly perpendicular or maybe a little bit perpendicular to the bulk flow. You know, the bulk flow of this, of this smoke is upward, all right, so we know that. Uh, but, one, you know, when, you, when it's going fast enough upward, it'll start to spontaneously break perpendicular to that, and that's where you start getting squirrels, swirls, Martin. So if you have that going on, Uh, no, you still have it. And in fact, that's what they do in air tunnels, in wind tunnels, I should say. You know, they evacuate the wind tunnel, and then they put a little bit of smoke through it. No, I, I, should t I take that back, because a wind tunnel's got to have air in it, right? But what they do is they put smoke in the wind tunnel, or some kind of stuff that'll, you know, leave a trace like that, and then they follow the streamlines. But um, no, that, that'll still happen in a, you know, in a, in a vacuum. You know, it, it's just, it still go upward. <laughs> F equals MA causes the turbulence. And E pluribus unum. And who? E pluribus unum. You know that phrase from our currency? Uh, from many one, E pluribus unum. So the whole idea is, uh, Martin, that the fluid is con consists of zillions and zillions of atoms or molecules that we cannot see. That's the pluribus. But from, from, from figuring out, from applying, and from assuming F equals MA holds for each of them, doing a bunch of stats, a bunch of trig, and a bunch of calculus, you can figure out stuff like velocities of the bulk motion, pressure of the bulk of, of fluid, you know, the temperature. And that's, the, that's the, basically what we call the kinetic theory of, a flu, of fluids, kinetic theory of matter. Uh, which I like to call the e pluribus unum principle. So that's where it comes from, you know. And you know, I don't know what else to tell you, and because it, it it can arise from, you know, like this last picture. It can arise from, you know, this bumpity stuff down here. Of course, that's natural, but it doesn't have to. It can, um, it can rise from just plain going the right speed. Uh, so let me keep going with this thing. Uh, bulk flow slows down a little bit, and here are the causes. As I said, any obstruction or sharp corner and an edge, uh, such as a, you know, in a faucet, you know, a faucet takes kind of a right turn, a right angle turn, uh, and it creates turbulence by imparting velocities perpendicular to the flow. But then, here's the other thing. The drag between adjacent layers of the fluid which is kind of hard to, but I mean, it's, it's like, you know, the, the, the friction between 
your hands, if your hands were considered to be two layers, then you, you know what friction is. It warms your hands up. Okay? And what this is saying is that that drag will um, engender some turbulence if the speed is large enough. And that's the last part that I have underlined there. And I'm not an expert on fluid mechanics. It's, one, it's probably the most difficult uh, field to be studying in physics. Uh, but but I, I do know that the guys that are experts on it would basically be saying, e pluribus unum. You know, the, the, there's, a, there's a process that happens at the right speed, the right bulk speed, where the drag fails and you start getting the, you know, the turbulent um, streamlines. You know, st stuff starts getting not just slowed down, but straight, it starts getting slowed down and, and breaking. And that's the, the identification of turbulence. All right. Now, I have a clicker question uh, for you. So get your clickers out. And this one's going to be a little bit different. Um, I'm going to ask you to fill in This is going to be a short answer question. And I'm going to ask you to type in a word. Okay? So as soon as I start this, uh, you'll see... Um, you'll see... Uh, so it's a survey, and I'll try to give everybody a point for this if you have something that's reasonable. And you'll see here, as soon as I start the question, that there's a lot of latitude for, you know, what kind of... what would be a good answer. So there might be uh, 27 different good answers, and 27 answers will get a point for this. So here's your question. Think of a part of the human body where one might find a turbulent flow. So those of you guys that have had anatomy class, and even those of you know that just that know seventh grade anatomy, you can type in an answer here. And I'll give you a minute to do that. And make sure to hit the send key when you've finished your word. So you, you can't write a sonnet, but one or two words. One word is good. Yeah, right. Okay. I could see somebody that wrote anus. <laughs> I don't consider it to be funny. I consider it to be an insult. Come up with something, you know, real. Yeah, okay. Good. Well, I, I guess there's a lot of people saying, screw you, Dr. B. Yeah, you know, I, I think this guy's trying to sp spell something that's righteous. Try to spell it correctly, you guys. Okay, uh, 20 seconds to finish. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Um, I see students typing in aorta. Uh, that's pretty good. That's a, that's a if, if you trying to spell aorta, but they spelled it wrong. I, oh, somebody changed it. There, it was a q r t a, but they they changed it. Let's see down here. Somebody wrote arm. I don't know what an arm. Uh, avioli. 
Alve I think it's alveoli. Yeah, so that's righteous. Blood, bloodstream, blood vessels. It's hard for me to see all these. Heart. Yeah, here's here's some answers. You know, if you know, you guys, I, I don't know what you're doing here. I really don't. And I know who I, I can tell who it is. Don't expect good things from me, my friend. All right. So here's a here's a diagram, chapter twelve point five, figure one. Uh, blood vessel, and many of you answered stuff like you know, aorta is a big blood vessel, and this is a uh, particularly um, dangerous effect. You know, when the the uh, plaque uh, that builds up in a in an elderly person, sometimes not so elderly, um, starts to restrict, you you get some turbulence. And apparently you can actually hear that with a stethoscope if you have the stethoscope in the right position. Uh, so that's a good thing to think about. Now, we got a, another clicker question. Uh, viscosity effects, they keep the laminar flow coherent. That's actually, so, um, if the velocity, if the viscosity is zero, the fluid's frictionless and it's it's not it's going to tend to not um, stay laminar as easily as something that does have some viscosity. Now, um, viscosity. Here's a table. Uh, don't w worry about uh, writing this down. We're, I'm going to we're going to do a calculation here in a second uh, for a Reynolds number, uh, but we're going to use this, these viscosities. The, the units are kind of weird for viscosity. It's Pascal second. Uh, and Pascal second is, huh? Yeah, Pascal is a, is a Newton per meter squared. And so, a new, it, and, so it, and, a, and it's a Pascal second. So it's a kilogram meter per second per square meter. Okay, so it's, it's pretty, it's pretty unusual. It's, it's, um, it's, it's got units of momentum per square meter, all right? And so here's some typical ones. Now, a couple things I want to show you about this. Look at air, air, CO2, and oxygen. They each have fairly small viscosity at 20 uh, Celsius. Uh, H2O at 20 Celsius is fluid. Uh, H2O at 37 Celsius, that's body temperature, 98.6 uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, much lower. And students, that's one of the interesting things about fluids that are viscous. As they heat up or as the temperature changes, the viscosity changes. And here's something that um, is, is actually important in many uh, scientific applications, for instance, like seismology. Uh, when, the, when, the, um, when the fluid uh, heats up or cools down, the speed of sound changes in the fluid. Okay, so if something is very rigid, like steel, it has, which is it's not really compressible, sound propagates really fast, you know, like along a railroad, uh, you know, tie, or along the railroad tracks. You know, you hammer it a mile away and just a second later you'll hear uh, the, ha the hammering sound. Uh, versus air, it's much, it's compressible um, and it, uh, it doesn't, you know, it has a, a much different speed of sound. So, so for instance, with H, uh, H2O here, um, the viscosity goes down uh, as the temperature increases, okay? And what that means is that um, the speed of sound also changes. And the speed of sound in water and the study of that is what we call sonar. And so the guys in the Navy that are trying to 
keep track of the Ruski subs and stuff like that and avoid being detected by Ruski subs, they have to keep track of the water conditions and basically the viscosity and stuff like that uh, because that affects sonar performance. You know, where, where, you know, you're hearing some, some submarine engine. Now, the Russians make really noisy uh, submarines, so we basically know where they are all, at all times pretty much. And, but, you know, exactly where they are depends on, you know, how, you know, the, the, you know, what the water conditions between you and the source. So, and you can see that in this table. Same thing with whole blood. Now, look at whole blood. 20 degrees and 37 degrees, you have a pretty big change in the viscosity from 3.015 to 2.084. Again, lower viscosity as it gets up to room temperature. And you can kind of see that, you know, when, when you have uh, blood that congeals, you know, if you, you know, if you, you have a nosebleed or something like that and a drop uh, falls on the table or something like that, it'll start to congeal when it assumes room temperature and eventually it'll dry out. Now look at olive oil. Look at the viscosity of olive oil at 20, at room temperature. So that's really big, right? So that's, that's the whole idea of throwing oil on troubled waters. And I think actually uh, cooks do that. They put a little bit of olive oil in to change the viscosity at the surface uh, of, the, uh, of the fluid that they're cooking up. Right, let's do a Reynolds number calculation. Re Reynolds number is a dimensionless quantity that encodes um, the, um, the readiness uh, of, the, uh, of the fluid to become turbulent or to stay laminar, all right? And for a tube, the formula is two times the density times the speed times the radius of the tube divided by eight of the, and eight is the viscosity. Um, and uh, just uh, the, the text, the nomenclature here, uh, sometimes you see a Reynolds number abbreviated RE. And so, and, but in the textbook, it's N subscript R, so that's what we're gonna go with. Uh, so rho is the fluid density. Uh, v is the fluid speed, so the bulk speed of the fluid. And for this one, and it's different for different kind of containers, but for a tube, this is the formula, right? And so, for instance, there's, a, there's an example of a textbook, all right? An intravenous uh, syringe. You know, you, you have an intravenous uh, saline solution at the hospital to rehydrate yourself. And, uh, you know, they put a... a a needle in your arm and you know then they you know tape it on there and then they let it start to drip and everything right so the fluid going through there and you know they adjust the speed by you know how high they hang the bag of the saline solution you know and and, and they also have a little valve some you know sometimes you have a little pump that puts it at a set speed and stuff uh, but it's, it's going through basically a syringe into your vein so that's it at room temperature uh, and then it starts uh, to assume a body temperature. So let's do a solution, a, a calculation, and you're going to do this uh, as a calculation in a second, a numeric problem. And uh, so let's use a velocity of 1.70 meters per second. And let's use the radius uh, of the syringe. Um, the inner uh, radius, uh, 0 0.150 millimeters. Okay, so that's uh, 0 0.000150 meters. And we'll use it as in meters here in a second when we do the calculation. Actually, you'll do it because you're going to do the calculation here in a second. Uh, and let's use uh, the viscosity, the same as water. So 1.00 uh, millipascal seconds. And uh, remember, a pascal is newton per meter squared, right? The, the units on this get really bodacious, but it's dimensionless. So the stuff on the bottom uh, cancels everything on the top, if you're careful. Question? Do you think on the final we're going to have, like, crazy conversions? We might. 
It's possible the final is cumulus. Question. Yeah, millipascal, no, it's millipascal seconds. So that means, you know, pascal in the numerator, seconds in the numerator. And it's tricky because a pascal, if you think about it, you have kilogram, a pascal is newtons per square meter. So you have kilogram meter per second squared divided by meter squared, all times seconds. Yeah, you just, it, it, you, you know, I always like to break things down to kilograms, meters, and seconds, and then start canceling like crazy. And I'll be showing you how to do that. But you guys are going to do this calculation. Now, use the density of 1025 kilograms per cubic meter. So that's a little bit higher than pure water. So this is, you know, it's got a little bit of salt dissolved in it. Okay, so 1025 is not uh, unrageous. All right, so that's calculation time for you. Um, and let me start the question. And I'll give you a few minutes to, to calculate. Just calculate the Reynolds number. All right, and mind your units. They're real tricky. And don't forget that radius is in millimeters. So convert that. First thing you got to do is convert that into meters. Because you're going to be canceling newtons, and newtons are meters, kilogram meters in seconds. Don't forget that factor of two. Uh, give me your answer to the nearest whole number. Don't give me any decimals. Because the range, you know, the Reynolds numbers goes up into the thousands, so you may as well just give me a whole number. What's that? N, that's Greek letter eta. The viscosity, yeah. Greek letter eta, it's millipascal seconds. Okay. So that's, so it's, that's what I was talking to the, these other guys about. Question? Repeat. I, ca I can't hear you. The viscosity eta is millipascals times seconds. So the numerator of pascals is Newton. The denominator is meter squared. So the so it's newton second divided by meter squared. All right. It's just a weird unit. Mm -hmm. 
The, no, I'm just saying that that's how we give. That I, I'm following the textbook example, and they gave it in millipascal seconds. Okay, and the previous one I think was just pascal seconds. The table that we have. Okay. Yeah, but everything cancels, so your result is going to be if you if you work your units out right, it's going to be you know a whole number. You know, so it's it's not going to be meters or meters per second or kilograms per meter or anything like that. Okay, thirty seconds. Twenty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Um, let's do the calculation. So here's our formula. And here's the plug-in step. And just look at that. That is... That is some bodacious. All right, so here's density, kilogram per cubic meter. Here's speed, that's easy. And here's radius. Now down here, here's the viscosity, Newton per meter squared, that's the Pascal, times a second. Now, the numeric part uh, works out to 0 0.52275 divided by 0 0.00. 0, 1, or 0 0.001. All right, so that's the numeric part. But check these units. Look at that. That is nasty, but if, if you write them all down and then start canceling carefully, they all cancel. And so you just have 0 0.52275 divided by 0 0.001, and that is uh, 523. So there's your answer. Raise your hand if you had 523. Uh, raise your hand if you had 522 point something. Uh, you might have rounded off wrong, okay? Yeah, so 523 is what I'm looking for. All right. Now this Reynolds number, and the, the, the difference between Laminar flow and turbulent flow is pretty important. For instance, here's a famous airplane from World War II, the P-51 Mustang. Now, they, de they developed... They developed what they called the laminar uh, airfoil uh, up at Langley at the, at the uh, NACA, as it was known then, uh, lab up there. And here's what the, the laminar... Uh, wing, the laminar airfoil looks like. Slightly different profile. You can see it looks more like a teardrop turned on its side. Uh, the traditional wing, you know, like from the Wright brothers and on up to the, to the 1940s, it was like half of a teardrop on its side. You know, down here, this is, this is almost flat down here. Now the difference is that turbulent flow started way back here for this shape of a wing. You know, they tested it out, they developed it so that the um, onset of turbulence was way back behind the halfway point instead of way up here for a conventional wing. Now, the advantage for that was that they were able to uh, fly faster because the turbulence introduces uh, drag and it slows down and it'll start shaking your plane apart, okay, if it gets bad. Okay, so this, this kind of a wing, you, you can't go very fast before you start getting turbulence up here. But the P-51, yeah. So they put a good Rolls-Royce Merlin engine in that baby, and that thing was a burner. You know, the P-51, the best plane in, in uh, World War II, according to a lot of pilots. And it's because of this wing, for, for most of them. You know, they had a good engine in there, too.
Rolls-Royce Merlin. So back here, a lot less turbulence, less drag, faster air, uh, air speed, longer range. They could fly it all the way to Germany and back with, with one extra gas tank and escorting all the, uh, the B-17s all the way over there and back. Amazing. Nobody else could do that. Okay. Now, the Reynolds number is significant. It, as I mentioned, it's the factor that if you look at its value, it'll, it'll tell you whether to expect laminar flow or turbulent flow. Now, laminar flow is for Reynolds number less than about 2,000. And turbulent flow is for a Reynolds number above 3,000 or so. All right. Now, the intervening range, 2,000 to 3,000, is where things get interesting. This is the region where it's very hard to predict, and we have a whole science devoted to that. Chaos, nonlinear systems, all right? And the, the way that um, we describe a chaotic system or a nonlinear system is this, that a very small change to the initial conditions can result in wildly different um, behaviors. You know, in the case of turbulent airflow, it can go from uh, a small change in the velocity from turbulent to laminar or back, all right? And that's what they've, you know, found to be the case. You know, that, you know for, for instance, if you change the velocity of, of flow, you might get, um, you know, uh, up into the 2,000 to 3,000, and then, you, you know, you've got a, a chaotic system. Now, we've already studied chaotic systems a little bit, nonlinear systems. Here's the, the uh, phase um, reconstruction of um, a, heart, a beating heart. We looked at this a few weeks ago. Sinus rhythm up on top uh, in phase space, and then uh, tachycard, ventral tachycardia. And look at that, ventral fibrillation. Those are considered chaotic systems. They're all over the place. All right? Another, we're not done yet. So, for instance, if you change the radius of the tube to 0 0.700 millimeters, uh, you're up at 2440 for the Reynolds number. So a small change in the speed could toggle you between terminal, between turbulent and laminar. And that's what you that's where exactly where you don't want to be. You want, you know, for most applications, you want to be laminar. Now, here's another situation of nonlinear chaos and stability. Uh, hurricanes. You know, a few of you were asking me, Dr. B, why do you always have the Hurricane Irma picture up there? Well, here's Hurricane Matthew. You know, and you know, you're, you're sitting down, you're hunkered down in your house here in Orlando. The plane, the hurricane, the eye of the hurricane is down here in Haiti. And you're watching it. And, but here's the thing that everybody, all the experts, the Weather Channel, NOAA, everybody, you know what they focus on? The central pressure. 934, at this point in... Matthew's path. That's millibars. Millibars of temperature. Now, here's what I want you to write down. The difference between 934 and regular fair weather 1013 millibars is 7.8%. Uh, That's it. So 7.8% change in the so that's a small change in the central pressure, but yet it leads to catastrophic weather. Here's a picture of Haiti. Here's a picture of St. Augustine up the road. So it's a very so weather is a very difficult nonlinear system, and it is inherently chaotic. Okay, now you may be dismissed. We're now finished with instruction for the semester. I'll see you on Monday.